guys, you are welcome. Thanks for clicking. So, this man is going to talk about Arabian before Islam. How Muslim history began before Prophet Muhammad. Let's check it out. Okay, so we were having a very interesting conversation about uh, Islam in general, the origins of it, and um, the nature of Arabia in general, the Gulf in general, before Islam. Where would you like to begin this story, sir? Because I think our listeners, our viewers, know a lot about Indian culture and Hinduism and Buddhism. But I was waiting for the right kind of guest to help us learn about Islam. And I'm glad to have you on. So, glad to be here. So, um, I would begin the story of uh, Islam, you know, in the pre-Islamic Arabia. Okay. That is, um, you know, we don't know things for certain uh, in uh, in antiquity, in the ancient world, when things happened exactly. And uh, we believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad was born around 570 CE, common era, or in the old way, AD. And uh, what was... Uh, Middle East like when he was born, what was uh, especially that area which he was born. So uh, today Saudi Arabia and even at that time the Arabian Peninsula could be divided into a few parts. The two main parts are the Hijaz and the Najd. The Najd is a central desert, you know, the area around Riyadh, etc. And the Hijaz is the Red Sea coast. So Mecca, Medina, Jeddah, they come in the area of Hijaz. So Prophet Muhammad was born in this area. Uh, he was born in Mecca in a tribe uh, called the Quraysh. And uh, within that tribe, there was a subgroup called the Banu Hashim, the House of Hashim. Uh, and uh, he was born in it um, to a gentleman called uh, Abdullah. His mother's name was Amina. And um, unfortunately, he was, uh, or as fate would have it, he was orphaned. His father passed away uh, even before uh, he was born. Mother passed away at six years of age. Um, he goes to live in the house of his grandfather, uh, Abdul Muttalib, for two years. Then the grandfather also passes away. And he goes to live in the house of his uncle, uh, Abu Talib. This is the story. Um, now, what exactly was the pre-existing um, religion of this part of the world? So, these people would uh, be normally categorized as uh, paganism. That is, they believed in a large number of gods. Um, they had a deity called Hubal, who was a Syrian god uh, of the moon. Um, they believed in uh, three daughters uh, called... Uh, uh, I, you know, derived from the Egyptian Isis, one of them. Well, and was the Egyptian religion still around at this point, like in the Gulf as well? Very interesting. So Egypt had already by this time converted to Christianity, Coptic Christianity. <clears throat> but Egypt's influence had been there because these were neighboring civilizations. So uh, their gods and goddesses, some of them had Arabian forms. In fact, um, it is believed that the Kaaba housed 360 idols. These 360 idols were uh, idols of the various tribes that occupied Arabia. Uh, most of this area was not settled territory. Arabs, that is Bedouins, were a tribal people. Each one had their own gods and goddesses. Um, um, uh, so, what happened was that some of these uh, Arabs had now become sedentary. They had settled down, uh, some in um, Yemen, of course. Ye Yemen had had a civilization for hundreds of years before that. But even in this area, that is in the Mecca area, Medina area, agriculture had arrived in some oasis towns. And then Mecca was, of course, a trading and religious center. So some Arabs or some Bedouins had settled down into sedentary life. And as you know, these are different stages of civilization. Tribal societies are usually considered more primitive, uh, they are simpler, life is more of a struggle and once you get down to sedentary life, your life becomes more assured, you have assured sources of water, food, etc. Your prosperity increases, so your demands also change of your society. Your society becomes more hierarchical mm. um, and it's no longer equal in the same way. So what we have here is um, a large number of tribes, um, they are bordered by two large empires. 
One is the empire of the Iranians, uh, Sasanian empire, these are Zoroastrians. On the other side, you have the Byzantine empire that is basically a, a, a Eastern Orthodox Christianity. They occupy the areas of Syria, Palestine, uh, all of that area, Anatolia, <coughs> and also uh, parts of Egypt. Um, the Iranians occupy what is most of Iran uh, all the way up to Iraq. Uh, this area is the area of Hijaz, Najd. This is ruled by local tribes. And below that, they have some kind of, a, in Yemen, they already have some kind of civilization and kingdoms, etc. On the other side of the Red Sea also, you have Christians because Abyssinia, which is today's Ethiopia, has already become Christian and it has a Christian king, etc. So you have an atmosphere of uh, quite a lot of diversity, I would say multi-religious atmosphere. Christians and Christian communities are also there in Arabia, but more like individual Christians are there. Um, but these, their Christianity would not be recognizable, say, to a European Christian because they follow different uh, sects, Nestorians, Coptics, etc. Um, Zoroastrians are there in small numbers. And then large communities of Jews are there because what has happened is that already the diaspora has taken place. That is, Jews have had uh, two waves, large, uh, I'm talking about two large waves, there are other, of uh, destruction. One was when um, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar II, invaded Palestine, Israel, and he drove them out and took them as some of them as slaves. <clears throat> then Cyrus the Great of Iran, uh, Persia. Who's um, shown in 300. I think his kid is, his <laughs> son is shown in 300. A, a, caricature, a caricature of him. It's not really him, you know. They, they made up, much of 300 is uh, kind of made up film. Okay. But yeah, kind of, they, they denote him. So, uh, exactly, yeah. The Cyrus name has come up a lot uh, uh -huh. in my history books, uh -huh. amongst my Parsi friends, of right, course. Right, right, right. Um, he was a Zoroastrian king? Yeah, and he was an amazing king, actually. Uh, people don't know his story. He was an amazing man because he uh, did not use slave labor at all, uh, which is very unusual in the ancient world. Okay, Everybody, including from India to the West, everybody's using slave labor. You can call it by different names. You can mm. call them dasas or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them. Okay? This guy never used slave labor. Paid he, his army. He paid every laborer, not just army, his laborers he paid, all who constructed everything. Not mm. only that, he freed the Jews. So Jews had been brought as slaves by Nebuchadnezzar II to Babylon. He defeats Nebuchadnezzar, takes over Babylon, and he frees them. He says, you are free to go. So what happens is not everybody returns to Palestine or Israel. Many of them settle in our surrounding areas. Some of them come to Arabia also, settle in Medina, Mecca, etc., etc. And they, they are very skilled people because they are from a more advanced civilization. So they know agriculture, which Arabs mm. don't. So they take over some of the best agricultural lands in the oasis in Medina. They take over, uh, they, they are very good in jewelry and crafts, and handicrafts. They, they are very good at making weapons because they come from more advanced civilization. So they, uh, they have also learning. But really the large wave of them comes in the second wave. That is when the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire also, as I mentioned, took over all of this area. Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Syria, all of this area. So what they do is that there is a rebellion in Israel. And after the second or third rebellion, they just destroy the temple at Jerusalem and they expel all the uh, Jews. That's how you get the Jewish diaspora in Europe, etc. Okay. And some of these diaspora Jews also come to Arabia and they settle in. So there's a two-wave migration. Some older, some later. <clears throat> but they are obviously, and uh, they have writing. Uh, our de uh, Arabs also have writing, but their Jewish uh, script have a scripture. So every religion doesn't have a scripture. Uh, now, uh, I'll get a little bit definitional. That is, what is scripture? Is script scripture is like the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas. Only more advanced civilizations, that is, civilizations which have had agriculture, etc., and have have writing and uh, organized religion, they they develop a scripture. Actually, the incident comes from Cyrus. One of the incident comes from Cyrus. So, or around this, you can say is around 500 BCE. And Cyrus says to the Jews that, uh, "Where is your scripture? Do you have something in writing in your religion?" And the Jews still don't have. They say, "No, sir, we don't have a written scripture." That means it was still a largely oral tradition of the Judaic people, but in, in uh, contact with the more advanced civilization, that is Iran, they also then uh, codify their scripture and uh, write down the Torah, etc. <clears throat> it may have come earlier, these stories, but they were not written down. 
just like homer stories homer stories initially were just oral stories mm. they were not written down they, they were written down i think later. that's the case with most of the ancient world it was mostly oral even the vedas it's interesting were orally transmitted yeah. so a brahmin would sit with young brahmin boys and he would instruct them to memorize and recite in a particular way and that's why the recitation of the vedas is more or less the same whether you go to kashmir or you go to kanyakumari because it has been orally taught in the precise way the meter and uh, that's the way to preserve it